Story three of the Doom of London Six Stories by Fred M. White. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Dust of Death The Story of the Great Plague of the Twentieth Century. The front door bell tinkled impatiently. Evidently somebody was in a hurry. Alan Hubert answered the call a thing that even a distinguished physician might do, seeing that it was on the stroke of midnight. The tall, graceful figure of a woman in evening dress stumbled into the hall. The diamonds in her hair shimmered and trembled. Her face was full of terror. "'You are Dr. Hubert,' she gasped. "'I am Mrs. Fillingham, the artist's wife, you know. Will you come with me at once? My husband! I had been dining out, in the studio.' oh please come hubert asked no unnecessary questions he knew fillingham the great portrait painter well enough by repute and by sight also for fillingham's house and studio were close by there were many artists in the devonshire park district that pretty suburb which was one of the triumphs of the builders and landscape gardeners art ten years ago it had been no more than a swamp Today people spoke complacently of the fact that they lived in Devonshire Park. Hubert walked up the drive and passed the trim lawns with Mrs. Fillingham hanging on his arm, and in at the front door. Mrs. Fillingham pointed to a door on the right. She was too exhausted to speak. There were shaded lights gleaming everywhere, an old oak and armour, and on a large portrait of a military-looking man propped up on an easel. On a lay figure was a magnificent foreign military uniform. Hubert caught all this in a quick mental flash, but the vital interest to him was a human figure lying on his back before the fireplace. The clean-shaven, sensitive face of the artist had a ghastly, purple-black tinge. There was a large swelling in the throat. "'He... he is not dead?' Mrs. Fillingham asked in a frozen whisper. Hubert was able to satisfy the distracted wife about that. Fillingham was still breathing. Hubert stripped the shade from a reading lamp, and held the electric bulb at the end of its long flex above the sufferer's mouth, contriving to throw the flood of light upon the back of the throat. "'Diphtheria!' he exclaimed. "'Labels type, unless I am greatly mistaken. Some authorities are disposed to scoff at Dr. Label's discovery.' I was an assistant of his for four years, and I know better. Fortunately, I happen to know what the treatment, successful in two cases, was. He hurried from the house and returned a few minutes later breathlessly. He had some strange-looking, needle-like instruments in his hands. He took an electric lamp from its socket and substituted a plug on a flex instead. Then he cleared a table without ceremony and managed to hoist his patient upon it. "'Now please hold that lamp steadily, thus,' he said. "'Bravo! You are a born nurse. I am going to apply these electric needles to the throat.' Hubert talked on more for the sake of his companion's nerves than anything else. The still figure on the table quivered under his touch, his lungs expanded in a long, shuddering sigh. The heart was beating more or less regularly now. Fillingham opened his eyes and muttered something. Ice, Hubert snapped. Have you got any ice in the house? It was a well-regulated establishment, and there was plenty of ice in the refrigerator. Not until the patient was safe in bed did Hubert's features relax. We'll pull him through yet, he said. I'll send you a competent nurse round in half an hour. I'll call first thing in the morning and bring Dr. Label with me. He must not miss this on any account. Half an hour later, Hubert was spinning along in a hansom towards Harley Street. It was past one when he reached the house of the great German savant. A dim light was burning in the hall. A big man with an enormous shaggy head and a huge frame, attired in the seediest of dress coats, welcomed Hubert with a smile. "'So, my young friend,' Label said, "'your face promises excitement.' "'Case of Label's diphtheria.' Hubert said crisply. Fillingham, the artist, who lives close by me. Fortunately they called me in. I have arranged for you to see my patient the first thing in the morning. The big German's jocular manner vanished. He led Hubert gravely to a chair in his consulting room, and curtly demanded details. 
He smiled approvingly as Hubert enlarged upon his treatment of the case. "'Undoubtedly your diagnosis was correct,' he said, puffing furiously at a long china pipe. "'You have not forgotten what I have told you of it. The swelling, which is caused by violent blood poisoning, yielded to the electric treatment. I took the virus from the cases in the north, and I tried them on scores of animals, and they all died. I find it is the virus of what is practically a new disease, one of the worst in the wide world. I say it recurs again, and it does. So I practice, and practice, to find a cure. And electricity is the cure. I inoculate five dogs with the virus, and I save two by the electric current. You follow my plans, and you go the first stage of the way to cure Fellingham. Did you bring any of that mucus here? Hubert produced it in a tiny glass tube. For a little time Label examined it under his microscope. He wanted to make doubly sure. "'It is the same thing,' he said presently. "'I knew that it was bound to recur. Why, it is planted all over our big cities, and electricity is the only way to get rid of it. It was the best method of dealing with sewage, only corporations found it too expensive. Wires in the earth charged to, say, ten thousand volts. Apply this and you destroy the virus that lies buried under hundreds of houses in London. They laughed at me when I suggested it years ago. Underground, Hubert asked vaguely. Ach, underground, yes. Don't you recall that in certain parts of England cancer is more common than in other places? The germs have been turned up in fields. I myself have proved their existence. In a little time, perhaps, I shall open the eyes of your complacent Londoners. You live in a paradise, ach, Gott! And what was that paradise like ten years ago? Dreary pools and deserted brickfields. And how do you fill it up and level it to build houses upon? By the carting of hundreds of thousands of loads of refuse, of course. Ach, I will presently show you what that refuse was and is. Now go home to bed." Mrs. Fillingham remained in the studio with Hubert while Label was making his examination overhead. The patient had had a bad night. His symptoms were very grave indeed. Hubert listened more or less vaguely. His mind had gone beyond the solitary case. He was dreading what might happen in the future. "'Your husband has a fine constitution,' he said soothingly. "'He has overtried it lately.' At present he is painting a portrait of the Emperor of Asturia. His Majesty was to have sat to-day. He spent the morning here yesterday." But Hubert was paying no attention. The heavy tread of Label was heard as he floundered down the stairs. His big voice was booming. What mattered all the portraits in the world, so long as the verdict hung on the German doctor's lips? "'Oh, there is a chance!' Label exclaimed. "'Just a chance! Everything possible is being done. This is not so much diphtheria as a new disease. Diphtheria family, no doubt, but the blood poisoning makes a difficult thing of it." Label presently dragged Hubert away after parting with Mrs. Fillingham. He wanted to find a spot where building or draining was going on. They found some men presently engaged in connecting a new house with the main drainage a deep cutting some forty yards long by seven or eight feet deep. There was the usual crust of asphalt on the road, followed by broken bricks and the like, and a more or less regular stratum of blue-black rubbish, soft, wet, and clinging, and emitting an odour that caused Hubert to throw up his head. "'You must have broken into a drain somewhere here,' he said. "'We ain't, sir,' the foreman of the gang replied. It's naught but rubbish, as they made up the road with here ten years ago. Lord knows where it came from, but it do smell fearful in weather like this." The odour indeed was stifling. All imaginable kinds of rubbish and refuse lay under the external beauties of Devonshire Park, in strata ranging from five to forty feet deep. It was little wonder that trees and flowers flourished here. And here, wet and dark and festering, was a veritable hotbed of disease. Contaminated rags, torn paper, road siftings, decayed vegetable matter, diseased food, fish and bones, all were represented here. Every ounce of this ought to have gone through the destructor, Label snorted. 
but no it is used for the foundations of a suburban paradise my word we shall see what your paradise will be like presently come along label picked up a square slab of the blue stratum put it in a tin and the tin in his pocket he was snorting and puffing with contempt now come to harley street with me and i will show you things he said he was as good as his word placed under a microscope a minute portion of the subsoil from devonshire park proved to be a mass of living matter there were at least four kinds of bacillus here that hubert had never seen before with his superior knowledge label pointed out the fact that they all existed in the mucus taken from fillingham on the previous evening there you are he cried excitedly you get all that wet sodden refuse of london and you dump it down here in a heap you mix it with a heap of vegetable matter so that fermentation shall have every chance then you cover it over with some soil, and you let it boil, boil, boil. Then, when millions upon millions of death-dealing microbes are bred and bred till their virility is beyond the scope of science, you build good houses on top of it. For years I have been prophesying an outbreak of some new disease, or some awful form of an old one, and here it comes they called me a crank because i asked for high electric voltage to kill the plague to destroy it by lightning a couple of high tension wires run into the earth and there you are see here he took his cube of the reeking earth and applied the battery to it the mass showed no outward change but once under the microscope a fragment of it demonstrated that there was not the slightest trace of organic life there label cried behold the remedy i don't claim that it will cure in every case because we hardly touch the diphtheretic side of the trouble when there has been a large loss of life we shall learn the perfect remedy by experience but this thing is coming and your london is going to get a pretty bad scare you have laid it down like port wine and now that the thing is ripe you are going to suffer from the consequence i have written articles in the lancet I have warned people, but they take not the slightest heed." Hubert went back home thoughtfully. He found the nurse who had Fillingham's case in hand, waiting for him in his consulting room. "'I am just back from my walk,' she said. "'I wish you would call at Dr. Walker's at Elm Crescent. He has two cases exactly like Mr. Fillingham's, and he is utterly puzzled.' Hubert snatched his hat and his electric needles, and hurried away at once. He found his colleague impatiently waiting for him. There were two children this time in one of the best appointed houses in Devonshire Park, suffering precisely as Fillingham had done. In each instance the electric treatment gave the desired result. Hubert hastily explained the whole matter to Walker. "'It's an awful business,' the latter said. "'Personally I have great respect for Label, and I feel convinced that he is right.' If this thing spreads, property in Devonshire Park won't be worth the price of slum lodgings. By midday nineteen cases of the so-called diphtheria had been notified within the three miles area known as Devonshire Park. Evidently some recent excavations had liberated the deadly microbe. But there was no scare as yet. Label came down again hotfoot with as many assistants as he could get, and took up his quarters with Hubert they were going to have a busy time. It was after two before Hubert managed to run across to Fillingham's again. He stood in the studio waiting for Mrs. Fillingham. His mind was preoccupied and uneasy, yet he seemed to miss something from the studio. It was strange, considering that he had only been in the room twice before. "'Are you looking for anything?' Mrs. Fillingham asked. "'I don't know,' Hubert exclaimed. I seem to miss something. I've got it. The absence of the uniform. They sent for it, Mrs. Fillingham said vaguely. She was dazed for want of sleep. The Emperor had to go to some function, and that was the only uniform of the kind he happened to have. He was to have gone away in it after his sitting today. My husband persuaded him to leave it when it was here yesterday, and— Hubert cried out suddenly as if in pain. He was here yesterday, here, with your husband, and your husband with the diphtheria in him? 
Then the weary wife understood. Good heavens! But Hubert was already out of the room. He blundered on until he came to a hansom cab creeping along in the sunshine. Buckingham Palace, he gasped. Drive like mad. A five-pound note for you if you get me there by three o'clock. Already Devonshire Park was beginning to be talked about. It was wonderful how the daily press got to the root of things. Hubert caught sight of more than one contents bill as he drove home that alluded to the strange epidemic. Dr. Label joined Hubert presently in Mrs. Fillingham's home, rubbing his huge hands together. He knew nothing of the new dramatic developments. He asked where Hubert had been spending his time. "'Trying to save the life of your friend, the Emperor of Asturia,' Hubert said. "'He was here yesterday with Fillingham, and though he seems well enough at present, he may have the disease on him now. What do you think of that?' Hubert waited to see the great man stagger before the blow. Label smiled and nodded as he proceeded to light a cigarette. "'Good job, too,' he said. "'I am honorary physician to the court of Asturia. I go back there, as you know, when I finish my great work here. The emperor I have brought through four or five illnesses, and if anything is wrong he always sends for me.' "'But he might get the awful form of diphtheria.' "'Very likely,' Label said coolly. "'All these things are in the hands of Providence. I know that man's constitution to a hair, and if he gets the disease I shall pull him through for certain. I should like him to have it.' "'In the name of all that is practical, why?' "'To startle the public,' Label cried. He was mounted on his hobby now. He paced up and down the room in a whirl of tobacco smoke. It would bring the matter home to everybody. Then, perhaps, something will be done. I preach and preach in vain. Only the Lancet backs me up at all. Many times I have asked for a quarter of a million of money, so that I can found a school for the electrical treatment of germ diseases. I want to destroy all malaria, all dirt and bulk, every bit of refuse that is likely to breed fever and the like, should be treated by electricity. I would take huge masses of deadly scourge and mountains of garbage and render them innocent by the electric current. But no, that costs money, and your poverty-stricken government cannot afford it. Given a current of ten thousand volts a year or two ago, and I could have rendered this one of the healthiest places in England. You only wanted to run those high-voltage wires into the earth here and there, and behold, the millions are slain, wiped out, gone for ever. Perhaps I will get it now." London was beginning to get uneasy. There had been outbreaks before, but they were of the normal type. People, for instance, are not so frightened of smallpox as they used to be. Modern science has learned to grapple with the fell disease and rob it of half its terrors. But this new and virulent form of diphtheria was another matter. Hubert sat over his dinner that night, making mental calculations. There were nearly a thousand houses of varying sizes in Devonshire Park. Would it be necessary to abandon these? He took down a large-scale map of London, and hastily marked in blue pencil those areas which had developed rapidly of recent years. In nearly all of these a vast amount of artificial ground had been necessary. Hubert was appalled as he calculated the number of jerry-built erections in these districts. A servant came in and laid the evening wire upon the table. Hubert glanced at it. Nothing had been lost in the way of sensation. The story of the Emperor's visit to the district had been given great prominence. An inquiry at Buckingham Palace had elicited the fact that the story was true. Well, perhaps no harm would come of it. Hubert finished a cigar and prepared to go out. As he flung the paper aside, a paragraph in the stop press column, a solitary paragraph, like an inky island in a sea of white, caught his eye. Quote, no alarm need be experienced as to the danger encountered by the Emperor of Asturia, but we are informed that His Majesty is prevented from dining at Marlborough House tonight, owing to a slight cold and sore throat caught, it is stated, in the drafts at Charing Cross Station. The Emperor will go down to Cowes as arranged tomorrow. Unquote. Hubert shook his head doubtfully. 
The slight cold and sore throat were ominous. His mind dwelt upon the shadow of trouble as he made his way to the hospital. There had been two fresh cases during the evening, and the medical staff were looking anxious and worried. They wanted assistance badly, and Hubert gave his to the full. It was nearly eleven before Hubert staggered home. In the main business street of the suburb a news shop was still open. A flaming placard attracted the doctor's attention. It struck him like a blow. Alarming illness of the Asturian Emperor, his majesty stricken down by the new disease, latest bulletin from Buckingham Palace. Almost mechanically Hubert bought a paper. There was not much beyond the curt information that the emperor was dangerously ill. Arriving home, Hubert found a telegram waiting him. He tore it open. The message was brief, but to the point. Have been called to Buckingham Palace. Label's diphtheria certain. Shall try and see you tomorrow morning. Label. London was touched deeply and sincerely. A great sovereign had come over here in the most friendly fashion to show his good feeling for a kindred race. On the very start of a round of pleasure he had been stricken down like this. The public knew all the details from the progress of that fateful uniform to the thrilling eight o'clock bulletin when the life of Rudolph III was declared to be in great danger. They knew that Dr. Label had been sent for post-haste. The big German was no longer looked upon as a clever crank, but the one man who might be able to save London from a terrible scourge, and from lip to lip went the news that over two hundred cases of the new disease had now broken out in Devonshire Park. People knew pretty well what it was, and what was the cause now. Label's warning had come home with a force that nobody had expected. He had stolen away quite late for half an hour to his own house, and there had been quite free with the pressmen. He extenuated nothing. The thing was bad, and it was going to be worse. So far as he could see, something of this kind was inevitable. If Londoners were so blind as to build houses on teeming heaps of filth, why, London must be prepared to take the consequences. Hubert knew nothing of this. He had fallen back utterly exhausted in his chair with the idea of taking a short rest, for nearly three hours he had been fast asleep. Somebody was shaking him roughly. He struggled back to the consciousness that Label was bending over him. "'Well, you are a nice fellow,' the German grumbled. "'I was dead beat and worn out,' Hubert said apologetically. "'How is the Emperor?' "'His Majesty is doing as well as I can expect. It is a very bad case, however.' I have left him in competent hands, so that I could run down here. They were asking for you at the hospital, presuming that you were busy somewhere. The place is full, and so are four houses in the nearest terrace. Spreading like that? Hubert exclaimed. Spreading like that. By this time tomorrow we shall have a thousand cases on our hands. The authorities are doing everything they can to help us. Fresh doctors and nurses and stores are coming in all the time. You turn people out of their houses to make way, then?" Label smiled grimly. He laid his hand on Hubert's shoulder, and piloted him into the roadway. The place seemed to be alive with cabs and vehicles of all kinds. It was as if the inhabitants of Devonshire Park were going away for their summer holidays simultaneously. The electric arcs shone down on white and frightened faces where joyous gaiety should have been. Here and there a child slept peacefully, but on the whole it was a sorry exodus. "'There you are,' Label said grimly. "'It is a night flight from the plague. It has been going on for hours. It would have been finished now, but for the difficulty in getting conveyances. Most of the cabmen are avoiding the place as if it were accursed. But money can command everything, hence the scene that you see before you. Hubert stood silently watching the procession. There was very little luggage on any of the cabs or conveyances. Families were going wholesale. Devonshire Park, for the most part, was an exceedingly prosperous district, so that the difficulties of emigration were not great. In their panic the people were abandoning everything in the wild flight for life and safety. Then he went in again to rest before the unknown labours of tomorrow. 
Next morning he anxiously opened his morning paper. It was not particularly pleasant reading beyond the information that the health of the Emperor of Asturia was mentioned, and that he had passed a satisfactory night. As to the rest, the plague was spreading. There were two hundred and fifty cases in Devonshire Park. Label's sayings had come true at last. It was a fearful vindication of his prophecy. And the worst of it was that no man could possibly say where it was going to end. Strange as it may seem, London's anxiety to the welfare of one man blinded all to the great common danger. For the moment Devonshire Park was forgotten. The one centre of vivid interest was Buckingham Palace. For three days crowds collected there until at length Label and his colleagues were in a position to issue a bulletin that gave something more than hope. The Emperor of Asturia was going to recover. Label was not the kind of man to say so unless he was pretty sure of his ground. It was not till this fact had soaked itself into the public mind that attention was fully turned to the danger that threatened London. Devonshire Park was practically in quarantine. All those who could get away had done so, and those who had remained were confined to their own particular district, provisioned on a system. The new plague was spreading fast. In more than one quarter, the suggestion was made that all houses in certain localities should be destroyed, and the ground thoroughly cleansed and disinfected. It would mean a loss of millions of money, but in the scare of the moment London cared nothing for that. At the end of a week there were seven thousand cases of the new form of diphtheria under treatment. Over one thousand cases a day came in. Devonshire Park was practically deserted, save for the poorer quarters, whence the victims came. It seemed strange to see fine houses abandoned to the first comer who had the hardihood to enter. Devonshire Park was a stricken kingdom within itself, and the commune of terror reigned. Enterprising journalists penetrated the barred area and wrote articles about it. One of the fraternity bolder than the rest passed a day and night in one of these deserted palatial residences, and gave his sensations to the press. Within a few hours most of the villas were inhabited again. There were scores of men and women in the slums who have not the slightest fear of disease, they are too familiar with it for that, and they came creeping westward in search of shelter. The smiling paradise had become a kind of Tom Tiddler's ground, a huge estate in chancery. Nobody had troubled, the tenants were busy finding pure quarters elsewhere, the owners of the property were fighting public opinion to save what in many cases was their sole source of income. If Devonshire Park had to be raised to the ground, many a wealthy man would be ruined. It was nearly the end of the first week before the abnormal state of affairs was fully brought home to Hubert. He had been harassed and worried, and worn by want of sleep but tired as he was, he did not fail to notice the number of poorer patients who dribbled regularly into the terrace of houses that now formed the hospital. There was something about them that suggested any district rather than Devonshire Park. "'What does it mean, Walker?' he asked one of his doctors. Walker had just come in from his hour's exercise, heated and excited. "'It's a perfect scandal!' he cried. The police are fighting shy of us altogether. I've just been up to the station, and they tell me it is a difficult matter to keep competent officers in the district. All along Frinton Hill and Eversley Gardens the houses are crowded with outcasts. They have drifted here from the East End, and are making some of those splendid residences impossible." Hubert struggled into his hat and coat, and went out. It was exactly as Walker had said. Here was a fine residence with stables and greenhouses and the like, actually occupied by Whitechapel at its worst. A group of dingy children played on the lawn, and a woman with the accumulated grime of weeks on her face was hanging something that passed for washing out of an upper window. The flower-beds were trampled down, a couple of attenuated donkeys browsed on the lawn. Hubert strolled up to the house fuming. Two men were sprawling on a couple of Morocco chairs, smoking filthy pipes. 
They looked up at the newcomer with languid curiosity. They appeared quite to appreciate the fact that they were absolutely masters of the situation. "'What are you doing here?' Hubert demanded. "'If you're the owner, well and good,' was the reply. "'If not, you take an ook it. We know which side our bread's buttered.' There was nothing for it but to accept this philosophical suggestion. Hubert swallowed his rising indignation and departed. There were other evidences of the ragged invasion as he went down the road. Here and there a house was closed and the blinds down, but it was an exception rather than the rule. Hubert walked away till he could find a cab, and was driven off to Scotland Yard in a state of indignation. The view of the matter rather startled the officials there. "'We have been so busy,' the chief inspector said, "'but the matter shall be attended to. Dr. Label was here yesterday, and at his suggestion we are having the whole force electrically treated, a kind of electrical hardening of the throat. The doctor claims that his recent treatment is as efficacious against the diphtheria as vaccination is against smallpox. It is in all the papers to-day. All London will be going mad over the new remedy to-morrow." Hubert nodded thoughtfully. The electric treatment seemed the right thing. Label had shown him what an effect the application of the current had had on the teeming mass of matter taken from the road-cutting. He thought it over until he fell asleep in his cab on the way back to his weary labours. London raged for the new remedy. The electric treatment for throat troubles is no new thing. In this case it was simple and painless, and it had been guaranteed by one of the popular heroes of the hour. A week before Label had been regarded as a crank and a faddist. Now people were ready to swear by him. Had he not prophesied this vile disease for years, and was he not the only man who had a remedy? And the Emperor of Asturia was mending rapidly. Had Label bidden the people to stand on their heads for an hour a day, as a sovereign specific they would have done so gladly every private doctor and every public institution was worked to death. At the end of ten days practically all London had been treated. There was nothing for it now but to wait patiently for the result. Another week passed, and then suddenly the inrush of cases began to drop. The average at the end of the second week was down to eighty per day. On the seventeenth and eighteenth days there were only four cases altogether, and in each instance they proved to be patients who had not submitted themselves to the treatment. The scourge was over. Two days elapsed, and there were no fresh cases whatever. Some time before a strong posse of police had swamped down upon Devonshire Park, and cleared all the slum people out of their luxurious quarters. One or two of the bolder dwellers, in that once favoured locality, began to creep back. Now that they were inoculated, there seemed little to fear. But Label had something to say about that. He felt that he was free to act now. He had his royal patient practically off his hands. A strong royal commission had been appointed by Parliament to go at once thoroughly into the matter. "'And I am the first witness called,' he chuckled to Hubert, as the latter sat with the great German smoking a well-earned cigar. I shall be able to tell a few things." He shook his big head and smiled. The exertion of the last few weeks did not seem to have told upon him in the slightest. "'I also have been summoned,' Hubert said. "'But you don't suggest those fine houses should be destroyed?' "'I don't suggest anything. I am going to confine myself to facts. One of your patent medicine advertisements says that electricity is life. Never was a truer word spoken. What has saved London from a great scourge? Electricity. What kills this new disease and renders it powerless? Electricity. And what is the great agent to fight dirt and filth with whenever it exists in great quantities? Always electricity. It has not been done before on the ground of expense, and look at the consequences. In one way and another it will cost London two million pounds to settle this matter. It was only a little over a third of that I asked for. Wait till you hear me talk." Naturally the greatest interest was taken in the early sittings of the Commission. 
a somewhat pompous chairman was prepared to exploit Label for his own gratification and self-glory. But the big German would have none of it. From the very first he dominated the committee. He would give his evidence in his own way. He would speak of facts as he found them. And, after all, he was the only man there who had any practical knowledge of the subject of the inquiry. "'You would destroy the houses?' an interested member asked. "'Nothing of the kind,' Label growled. "'Not so much as a single pigsty. If you ask me what electricity is, I cannot tell you. It is a force in nature that as yet we don't understand. Originally it was employed as a destroyer of sewage, but it was abandoned as too expensive. You are the richest country in the world, and one of the most densely populated. Yet you are covering the land with jerry-built houses, the drainages of which will frequently want looking to. And your only way of discovering this is when a bad epidemic breaks out. Everything is too expensive. You will be a jerry-built people in a jerry-built empire. And your local authorities adopt some cheap system, and then smile at the ratepayers, and call for applause. Electricity will save all danger. It is dear at first, but it is far cheaper in the long run. If you will be so good as to get to the point, the chairman suggested. Label smiled pityingly. He was like a schoolmaster addressing a form of little boys. The remedy is simple, he said. I propose to have a couple of ten thousand volt wires discharging their current into the ground here and there over the affected area. Inoculation against the trouble is all very well, but it is not permanent, and there is always danger while the source of it remains. I propose to remove the evil. Don't ask me what the process is, don't ask me what wonderful action takes place. All I know is that some marvellous agency gets to work and that a huge mound of live disease is rendered safe and innocent as pure water. And I want these things now. I don't want long sittings and reports and discussions. Let me work the cure and you can have all the talking and sittings you like afterwards." Label got his own way. He would have got anything he liked at that moment. London was quiet and humble, and in a mood to be generous. Label stood over the cutting whence he had procured the original specimen of all the mischief. He was a little quiet and subdued, but his eyes shone and his hand was a trifle unsteady. His fingers trembled as he took up a fragment of the blue-gray stratum and broke it up. "'Marvellous mystery!' he cried. "'We placed the wires in the earth, and that great, silent, powerful servant has done the rest. Underground the current radiates, and, as it radiates, the source of the disease grows less and less, until it ceases to be altogether. Only try this in the tainted areas of all towns, and in a short time disease of all kinds would cease for ever. "'You are sure that stuff is wholesome now?' Hubert asked. "'My future on it!' Label cried. Wait till we get it under the microscope. I am absolutely confident that I am correct. And he was. End of story three. Story four of The Doom of London. Six stories by Fred M. White. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A Bubble Burst How a Stock Exchange Scare Dislocated the Life of the Empire for Two Days The era of peace, which seemed to be well begun in 1906, was naturally marked by an extraordinary commercial and financial activity. An amount of worldwide speculations, never equaled in intensity, even in the mad times of the South Sea Bubble, or when Hudson, the railway king, flourished. The countless millions piled up in English banks, earning a two and a half percent interest, were lavishly withdrawn, new mines had been started, everybody was going to be rich. On the face of it, people had good ground for their sanguine expectations. The Rand, with its forty square miles of rich gold-bearing reefs, containing an untold number of immense fortunes, the richest region on earth, was properly administered for the first time. 
from the highest to the lowest everybody was investing their savings in south africa in other words there was a tremendous boom nothing like it had ever been seen in the history of commerce it was the golden hour of the promoter yet for the most part the schemes promised well there was however an enormous amount of rubbish in the market some of the more thoughtful financiers scented danger ahead but they were not listened to the roar of the kaffir circus resounded in men's ears and made them mad park lane would never be able to hold the new millionaires all england was in the grip of the mania bona fide speculation and business had become gambling pure and simple london thought of nothing else the city was crammed with excited buyers and operators the little outside broker of yesterday came down to his offices behind a pair of blood horses and his diamonds were a solid sign of his new prosperity a busy day was drawing to a close carl ericsson sat in his office smoking a cigarette ericsson yesterday had been waiter in an unimportant restaurant today he had a fine set of offices and a small mansion at hampstead he had arrived on the crest of the wave as many far less astute adventurers had done there was a peculiarly uneasy grin on his dark features a curious twitching of the lips and he had the tired eyes of the sleepless his partner sat opposite him behind a big cigar he was a fat man with a big jaw and a merciless mouth six months before eli smith had been a fairly well-to-do suburban butcher now he was e asherton smith the big financial agent he boasted with truth that he could sign a cheque for forty thousand pounds and be none the worse for it in the area of the city it would have been difficult to find two choicer specimens of rascality than the partners in ericsson and company got a big card to play eh asherton smith asked ericsson grinned nervously his lithe little body was quivering with excitement. There was a furtive look in his drooping eyes. "'The ace of trumps,' he gurgled. "'The coup of the century. Eli, my boy, how much money could we make if we could scare South Africans down five or six points for a week?' Mr. Asherton Smith's diamonds heaved with emotion. "'Millions,' he said. "'Just as many millions as we could stagger under. Makes my mouth like sawdust to think of it but pass out a bottle of champagne ericsson did so rose from his seat and peeped into the outer office the clerks had all gone for the day he closed the door gently i'm going to tell you he said if i don't tell somebody i shall go mad i can't sleep at nights for thinking of it when i do doze off i'm swimming in a river of sovereigns with a bit of luck it's a certainty get on carlo you're just playing with my feelings well it's just this way ericsson's voice dropped to a whisper there are two lines of cable by which south africa can communicate with the outside world the east and west africa cables the west coast line isn't to be relied upon it breaks down at least once a week at a time like this a breakdown is a serious matter the directors have taken the bull by the horns so at the present moment the west coast line is out of our calculations it's under repair and it's likely to remain so for some time to come i've ascertained that communication with south africa by the western line is impossible for the next fortnight no message can come or go by that route this leaves us only the eastern line to grapple with if that kindly breaks down for four-and-twenty hours our fortunes are safe is it likely asherton smith asked why yes it has happened three times during this year i tell you i have followed this thing pretty keenly it's more than on the cards suppose the breakdown did come eli and we had the last message through look at this ericsson took from a safe a sheet of paper a cablegram message in fact sent cut from the office of the east africa company it was a genuine document enough with the date and the hour showing that it had been dispatched from cape town on the afternoon of the same day there were words upon it to the effect that bertha has lost her aunt and the water has been packed in the matchbox that isn't our cipher asherton smith said quite right it's the cipher used by the messenger 
The messenger, my boy, enjoys as high a reputation as the times. If a cablegram appeared in the messenger tomorrow, saying that there had been an earthquake on the Rand, and that the Johannesburg waterworks had overflowed into the deep levels, everybody could take it for gospel. That's why I managed to get a hold of and learn the messenger cipher. On the off chance of the eastern cable breaking down, I've had a cable sent to me every day from a friend in South Africa saying that there has been an earthquake in Johannesburg, and that the mines are flooded out. The cable comes to me in the cipher used by the messenger people. That's what all that gibberish about Bertha and the water and the matchbox means. Suppose you were to walk into the office and say the eastern line of the cable had broken down. As the western line is under repair, that tells me that communication with South Africa is impossible for a day or more. Probably the lines would be unavailable for nearly a week. I've got a spare envelope or two used by the Eastern Company for their messages. I put this flimsy inside and alter my own address, Bonan to Bonanza, which is the registered cable address of the messenger, by the addition of two letters, and there you are. That's why I thought of Bonan, and that little office of mine in Long Lane, where I am known as James Jones. I've had this scheme in my mind for years. A boy drops into the messenger office and hands over the cablegram, and there you are. The thing looks perfectly in order. It is the private cipher of the big newspaper, and, moreover, it is quite up to date. If the cable breaks down, no questions can be asked, and the thing goes into the paper. We've only got to get the same message sent to me every day, and sooner or later our chance comes." Asherton Smith was breathing heavily. The prospect was dazzling. Somebody was tapping at the outer door. A large man in a big fur coat entered. "'What are you beggars conspiring about?' he asked. "'Got something extra special from down below? Egad, I'd give something for a private wire of my own. We'll get a rest for a day or two. The East Africa cable is bust up south of Mauritius." The intruder helped himself to a glass of champagne that he obviously didn't want, and drifted out again. The partners glanced at one another without speaking. Perhaps they were just a little frightened. The thing appeared to be absolutely certain. So far as they could see, the story would be believed implicitly, for the messenger was absolutely reliable. The great beauty of the whole scheme was its conclusiveness. There had never been an earthquake on the Rand, but there was no reason why there shouldn't be. And an earthquake would assuredly destroy the Johannesburg waterworks, which would mean washing away half the place, and the flooding of some of the richest mines below the town. The West Coast cable was under repair and incapable of use, but that frequently happened, as most people interested in South Africa know. There was no chance of the truth trickling back to London via Australia or New York, and now the eastern line had broken down also, as all deep-sea cables do on occasion. "'Upon my word, I can't see a flaw anywhere,' Ericsson remarked in a voice that trembled. "'If the eastern line is repaired by morning, we shall be none the worse off. Our coup will have been miscarried. A few inquiries will be made, and James Jones will never be seen in Long Lane office again." Asherton Smith went home and dined and drank, but sleep was not for his pillow that night. The papers were late in the morning, and that did not lessen his irritability. The breakfast stood untouched, beyond a little dry toast, and some brandy and soda water. Just for the moment, the prosperous Asherton Smith regretted the day when he had been the oily and irresponsible Eli Smith butcher. The papers came at last, a whole pile of them, but Asherton Smith only desired to see the messenger. He fluttered it open with fingers that trembled. There it was, the news that he sought. He drew a deep breath. Usually the messenger avoided sensation, but here was a scoop that no human editor could possibly resist. The headlines danced before the reader's eyes. Earthquake at Johannesburg, destruction of the waterworks and the flooding of the mines, great loss of life and property. The messenger, alone of all the papers, contained this news. 
A map of Johannesburg, right away from the waterworks to the five-mile belt, where the world-renowned mines lay, only served to make the story more convincing. The water would have swept over the city, from the aristocratic suburb of Dornfontein to the auriferous belt that held the wealthy mines. There were hundreds of millions of money invested here. The news of the disaster would have a depressing effect upon the stock exchange. Weak holders would be pretty certain to lose their heads, and the markets would be flooded with shares. Asherton Smith trembled as he thought of his forthcoming fortune. A little after ten o'clock he was in the city. In the train and in the streets people were talking about nothing but the great disaster in South Africa. Nobody doubted the story, though only the messenger contained it. Unfortunately, the eastern line had broken down at a critical moment, and no details were forthcoming for the time being. The messenger's cable had been the last to come through. "'Going all right, eh?' Asherton Smith asked. His teeth were chattering, but not with cold. "'Pretty satisfied, eh?' Ericsson nodded and grinned. He looked white and uneasy. "'I've started the machinery,' he said. When prices have dropped five or six points, we are going to buy quietly. Mind you, I'm going to make no secret of it. I'm going to pose as the savior of the market. The one man who refuses to bow to the panic shall swagger about the stuff being there in spite of a dozen earthquakes. I shall boast that at bedrock prices we can afford to buy to hold. That line will avert suspicion from us when the cat is out of the bag and our fortune's made and you'll have to back me up in this. What a row there will be when the truth comes to be told. Ericsson and his partner pushed their way past inquisitive spectators who had nothing to lose, and therefore enjoyed the strange scene. They elbowed wealthy-looking men in all the garb of prosperity, whose haggard faces gave the lie to their outer air. Everybody was constrained and alert. The big financiers who usually controlled the markets were getting frightened. They assumed that there must be no panic. They desired that nothing should be done till the full magnitude of the disaster could be verified. But people believed in the integrity of the messenger, which had never played them false yet. The great men of the exchanges and the marts had forgotten their human nature for the moment. They were asking poor humanity to put aside greed and self-interest and love of money, the father to forget his savings and the widow to ignore her dividends. They might just as well have appealed to the common sense of a flood tide swept by the gale. Two of the big men were penned on the pavement on Cornhill. Their names were good on change for any amount in reason. They reckoned themselves rich and comfortable but the strain of the situation was getting on their nerves. "'I'll give fifty thousand pounds to have my way here for a few hours, Henderson,' said one. "'I'd give twice that to feel that I had what I deemed myself to possess yesterday,' said Sir James Henderson. "'What would you like to do, Kingsley?' "'Clear the streets,' the great bullion broker replied. "'Get some troops and maxims, and declare the city in a state of siege for eight and forty hours.' Pass a short act of Parliament prohibiting people from dealing in stocks and shares for a week. By that time the panic would have allayed itself, and folks regained their sanity. As it is, thousands are going to be ruined. Every share in the South African market is absurdly inflated, and, even if the disaster is small, prices must keep low. But there is worse coming than that, my friend." Already rumours were spreading far and wide as to the fall of certain shares. Mines that yesterday stood high in the estimation of the public were publicly offered at a reduction of from eight to ten points. Even the gilt-edged securities were suffering. The feeling grew that nothing was safe. It is the easiest thing in the world to shake public assurance where money is concerned. With one accord the thousands of large and small speculators had set out for the city to get rid of their liability on the earliest possible occasion. They asked for no profits, they demanded no margin. They would have been content to get out at a loss. It never occurred to the individual that the same brilliant idea might strike a million brains simultaneously. 
With one accord they rushed to the line of action that might be the ruin of one-third of them. Just for the time, purchases by a few bold speculators stopped the rush. But presently they got filled up or frightened, so that by two o'clock some of the best paper in the market was begging at a few shillings the one-pound share. When the fact struck New York and reacted on the London market, nobody knew what might happen. It was fortunate that sellers could not unload at once. Sheaves of telegrams tumbled into brokers' offices, the floors were littered with orange envelopes, the city was musical with the tinkle of telephones. The heads of firms, half mad with worry and anxiety, were offering the girls in the telephone exchange large sums to connect them with this office and the other. The usual sane city of London was as mad now as it had been in the days of the South Sea bubble. By three o'clock, however, business on the stock exchange had practically come to a standstill. It was useless to deal with waste paper. Tomorrow the crowd would doubtless be augmented by thousands of provincial speculators. Already the foreign bourses were suffering under the strain. Early in the afternoon there were rumours and signs of an excited struggle in Lothbury. What had happened now? People were straining their ears to listen. The news came in presently. There was a run on the South African Industrial Bank. When the crowd began to clamour at the doors of the South African Industrial, the manager slipped out by a side entrance and made the best pace he could in the direction of the Bank of England. Once there, all his self-possession deserted him. He asked wildly to see the chief cashier, the general manager, the governors, anybody who might help him for the moment. But the officials had other things to occupy their attention. From all parts of the country, intelligence had arrived to the effect that the panic was at its height. It was only now that the big financiers realized what a large amount of fanatical gambling there had been in South Africans. Everybody had been going to make their fortunes, from humble clerks up to the needy aristocrats. Every penny that could be raked together had gone that way. And now the country had taken it into its head that the rand was lost. Wild appeals had been made to the Eastern Cable Company to do something, but they could only reply that their line had broken down somewhere beyond Mauritius, and that until it could be fished up and spliced. South Africa might as well be in the moon. People were acting as if the rand had been swallowed up altogether. The Bank of England was full of great financiers at their wits' ends for some means of allaying the panic and restoring public confidence. The great houses, Rothschild and Coutts, and the rest, were represented in the governor's parlour. The presiding genius of the South African industrial found his way into the meeting. He was sorry to trouble them. He would not have come unless he had been absolutely bound to. But there was a run on his bank, and he wanted two million pounds immediately. As to security... One of the grave financiers laughed aloud. It seemed an awful thing to do in that solemn and decorous parlour, but nobody seemed to notice. But there was a general consensus of opinion that the money must be forthcoming. If one sound bank was allowed to topple over, goodness only knew where the catastrophe might end. "'You will have to do with five hundred thousand for the present,' the chairman said. "'There are sure to be applications. You must be diplomatic. Festina lente, you know.' If I could keep open straight away until... Madness! Keep to your regulations. Close at four o'clock. Delay is everything. The big clock in the room boomed the hour of four. It was as if some long-drawn mental agony had suddenly ceased. The manager of the South African Industrial fought his way back to the offices with a little comfort at the back of his mind. There was a lull in the roar as he appeared. He took advantage of it. His courage had come back to him now. "'Close the doors,' he said sharply. "'It's past four o'clock.' The mob yelled its protest. A big man climbed over the trellis along the counter. Just for a moment it looked like a lawless riot, but a cashier whipped a revolver out from a drawer, and as the big man looked down the blue bore his courage failed him. There was no further rush 
But, at the same time, there was no disposition on the part of the crowd to retire. "'We are closed for the day,' the manager said with considerable coolness. "'You can't expect me to stay here all night merely because you have taken it into your heads to want your money all at once. Come tomorrow, and you shall be paid.' A derisive howl followed. The manager whispered something to one of the clerks, and the latter slipped out. Presently there was a commotion at the doors, and a half-dozen helmets topped the crowd. There was a swaying movement till the long counter creaked again, an oath or two, uplifted sticks, and the smashing of a policeman's helmet. For the next few minutes there was something in the nature of a free fight, blows were freely exchanged, and more than one face bore traces of blood. But there is always something besides physical force behind law and order and gradually the mob turned back. Gradually the counting-house was cleared, and the iron shutters let down. But the city did not clear. The wildest rumours were in the air. Other banks, doing a more or less large business in the way of withdrawals, had followed the example of the South African industrial, and this had not tended to restore public confidence. It was pretty clear that every house would have to face a similar run on the morrow. At eight o'clock the streets were still crowded. It was fairly warm. There was little or no traffic after dusk, and it became evident that thousands of people had all tacitly resolved to do the same thing, remain in the streets all night outside their particular offices or business houses, and wait so that they might have the first chance in the morning. People sat on the paths and in the roadway. Every city house of refreshment had been depleted of food long since. Under the big electric lamps people reclined, reading the evening papers. It was a gigantic picnic, with tragedy to crown the feast. There was no laughter, nothing but grim determination of purpose. The papers were full of bad news from the provinces. Everywhere public credit was shaken to the breaking point. There had been runs on scores of local banks. In the West End there was only one topic of conversation, but the theatres and restaurants were open, and life was going on much the same. In a private room at the Savoy, Ericsson and his partner in guilt were dining. The waiters had gone, the wine and cigars stood on the table. There was a subdued look about both of them, a furtive cast of the eyes, and just a suggestion of slackness in their hands, not due entirely to the champagne. It was a long time before either of them spoke. "'Pretty warm day, Eli,' Erickson suggested. Asherton Smith wiped his red damp forehead. "'Rather,' he said. "'I'm not so sharp as you, you know, but I'd forfeit a few thousands to be well out of this.' Ericsson was not so contemptuous of his thick-witted partner as usual. "'I should like to know what you are driving at,' he muttered. "'Well, we've been too sharp. We've played the game too far. Shares were only to drop a few points, and we were to buy for the rise. We've laid out every penny that we could rake together for the rise. And what have we got? Some hundreds of thousands of shares a few points below par? Not a bit of it. If this panic waits two days longer, we shall have exchanged all our own cash and our own credit for a ton or two of waste paper. It will all come back again, Ericsson said uneasily. Ah, but when? The bogey has been too big for the public. We've given them a scare that they will not get over in a hurry for many a day. We've shown them what might happen, and they tumbled to the fact that things are far too inflated. The fall of a few points would have put millions into our pockets. As it is, we shall have to hold on perhaps for months. And we're not strong enough to do that. If the cable works again tomorrow, Ericsson said hoarsely, after a pause, it... Yes, and if it doesn't? And if the thing goes on, what then? And if there should be a run tomorrow on the Bank of England? I never thought of that, Ericsson groaned. Pass the brandy. If only tomorrow were Saturday instead of Thursday. A pretty black Thursday it's going to be. Ericsson and Asherton Smith were still sipping their brandy, but they were no longer gloating over their prey with shining eyes. They no longer counted their prospective millions. 
Like the greedy fox, they had dropped the substance for the shadow. They were going to be ruined with their victims. With moody, furtive, bloodshot eyes, they looked at each other. "'I suppose we can't drop a hint?' Ericsson suggested. "'Drop a hint?' Asherton Smith sneered. "'You're a clever chap, you are. Too clever by half. But if that's all the idea you've got, you'd better shut up. Perhaps you'd like to go and tell the story to the Lord Mayor?' Ericsson's fine turn for repartee seemed to have deserted him. "'Who could have anticipated anything like this?' he groaned. "'And the worst of it is that we dare not say a word. The merest hint would invite suspicion, and you may be pretty sure that they would make the punishment fit the crime. We'll just have to grin and bear it.' Asherton Smith shook his fist in the speaker's face. "'You miserable swindler!' he yelled. But for you I should have been a rich man today, and now I am ruined, ruined!" Ericsson bent his head meekly, with never a word to say. The city was awake earlier than usual next morning. Indeed, for once, it had not slept. By nine o'clock in the morning the streets were packed. The haggard-eyed, sleepless ones gained nothing by their tenacity for they were pushed from pillar to post by others, fresh for the fray. The provincial trains from an early hour had commenced to pour fresh forces into London. A great many businessmen had slept as best they could in their offices, feeling pretty sure that it was the only way to be on the spot in the morning. They looked tired and worn out. It was a quiet, persistent, grim crowd. There was no hustling or horseplay, or anything of that kind, even the ubiquitous humorist was absent. They pushed on persistently, a denser crowd round the large banks. As soon as the shutters were down and the doors opened, the human tide streamed in. The run on the banks had set in grimly. Clerks and cashiers from distant branches had been brought up to meet the pressure. There was a confidence in the way they bustled about and handled and paid out the money that was not without its effect. More than one man eyed the pile of notes in his hand and passed them back over the counter again. Here and there people were bewailing the loss of their money. It was the golden hour of the light-fingered fraternity. They were absolutely covered by the dense crowd so that they could pursue their vocation with impunity. They had only to mark down some rich prize and plunder. Individuals shrieked that they had been robbed, but nobody took any notice. A burly, red-faced farmer yelled that he had been robbed of eight hundred pounds in Bank of England notes. Someone by him retorted that it was no loss, seeing that there was a run on the great national bank. It was the thrilling moment of the day, a run on the Bank of England, and yet it seemed in the light of new circumstances to be the most natural thing in the world. Would the bank be able to cash its own notes? If not, well, if not nobody could foresee the end. There were thousands of curious people in the crowd who had no business there whatever, not that there was any business properly so called done in London that day. There was a surging rush in the direction of Threadneedle Street. It would be something in afterlife to say that one had seen a run on the Bank of England. Inside the paying departments huge piles of gold and silver glittered in the sunshine, it was a curious and thrilling contrast between the grave decorum of the clerks and the wild, fierce rush of the public. The piles of gold and the easy unconcern of the officials satisfied a good many people who pushed to the counters and then fell back again muttering uncomfortably, but in real truth the bank managers were becoming a little anxious. Lord Fairchild, the great capitalist, with his houses in every big city of the world, contrived at length to reach the bank parlour. There was a full meeting of the chairman and governors. A cheerful tone prevailed. "'I sincerely hope we may weather the storm,' the chairman said anxiously. "'We have had no signal of distress from anyone. But I shall be glad when it is over.' Everybody looked tired and worn out. One or two of the governors had fallen asleep in their chairs. There was a litter of lunch on the table, but very few of those assembled there seemed to care anything for food. "'I calculate that we can last another day,' 
Lord Fairchild said. By tomorrow I hope we shall have contact with Cape Town again. Every effort was being made to bring about this desirable consummation. The broken line might be repaired at any moment. News had come from the Mauritius that the broken cable had been fished up, but there was no further information since midnight. Possibly, when contact could be made again, the disaster would prove to be much less than the last message had forecasted. "'It must come,' one of the governors sighed. "'It must come soon, or Parliament will have to deal with this question. Another two days—' "'I prefer not to think of another two days,' Lord Fairchild replied. "'If the worst comes to the worst, government must guarantee our paper.' We shall have to issue treasury bills to make up our deficit. We— An excited individual burst without ceremony into the room. His hat was off. His smart frock coat was torn to ribbons. I am from the office of the East Cable Company, he gasped. I was told to come here at once. My lord, I have the most extraordinary news. The great disaster at Johannesburg is, is, is— Get on, man. We are all impatience. Is— is no disaster at all. We have verified it. Our agent at Cape Town says he has heard nothing of it. Johannesburg stands where it did. There are four messages through, and, well, there has been a cruel fraud, and we are doing our best to get to the bottom of it. A rousing cheer echoed through the bank parlor. The governors yelled and shook each other by the hand like schoolboys. Probably the decorum of that room had never been so grossly violated before. Lord Fairchild passed into the great office where the public were still pushing and struggling. He stood on a table, his spare and striking figure standing out conspicuously. There were hundreds present who recognized that noble figure. Gentlemen, Lord Fairchild cried, I have just received the most authentic information that Johannesburg stands intact today. There has been trickery somewhere, but, thank heaven, the panic is over. A perfect yell followed. Men went frantic with delight. When Lord Fairchild said a thing, it was accepted as gospel. Hats went high in the air. People shook hands with perfect strangers. There was a rush to pay gold back and take notes instead. The news spread in the marvellous magnetic way common to the ear of a huge multitude. It ran with lightning speed through the streets. Everybody seemed to know like magic that Lord Fairchild had made a short speech in the Bank of England to the effect that the scare was over. In less than ten minutes the various bank officials were deeply engaged in taking back again the piles of gold they had so recently paid out. The mob roared out patriotic songs. There was a rush in all directions. For the next hour or so, the telegraph lines fairly hummed with messages. Within an hour, the city had regained much of its usual busy decorum, save for the long stream of people who were getting rid of their gold once more. With a view to prevent any further exploiting and financial uneasiness on the part of the speculating fraternity, the committee of the stock exchange met and formally closed the house till Monday. Under the circumstances, the step was an exceedingly wise one. In the seclusion of the bank parlour, Lord Fairchild was closeted with the editor of The Messenger. He had come down post-haste to the city to vindicate his character. The famous cablegram lay on the table. "'I need not say, my lord,' he began, "'that I—' "'You need not say anything about yourself,' Lord Fairchild said kindly. We are quite convinced that you have been made a victim. But how? I can only theorize at present, the messenger editor replied, and you, gentlemen, will understand, a great newspaper like ours has correspondence everywhere. We also have a special cipher known only to ourselves. Our man at the Cape is absolutely reliable. Now somebody must have stolen our cipher or possessed himself of the key. Cables come to us addressed to Bonanza. Such was the cable that reached us on the day that the eastern line broke down. Seeing that it was absolutely in order, and apparently delivered in the usual way, we used it under the impression that we had a great piece of news, and one that possibly our rivals did not possess. There was nothing in the appearance of the cablegram to excite our suspicions, 
but since the news of its falseness has come through, I have had it examined by an expert who reports that the original telegram had been directed to Bonan and not to Bonanza. The last two letters had been cleverly forged, but under a very strong glass the forgery is clear. Now you can see the trap. I have been to the office of the cable company, and, as I expected, I find that a message was sent on the day in question from Cape Town to a registered Bonan. This Bonan turns out to be one James Jones, who has an office in Long Lane. Of course that office was taken for the express purpose of getting that message, so that in case the eastern line broke down, the paper could be forced upon us. Unfortunately, it was forced upon us with dire results. We find that the message was repeated day by day in the hopes of a breakdown. Now, lots of big houses down south, cable quotations, lists of prices, finds of gold dust, and the like every day. All these are in cipher, and perhaps a fortnight might pass without any fluctuations, which would mean practically the receipt of an identical message for days. Nothing but a close search of the records could have aroused suspicion. Besides, the line had broken down, and all the energies of the company were devoted to that. If any of you gentlemen like to call at the cable company's offices and see the scores of duplicate cipher messages, all more or less alike, you will be convinced that the employees there are not in the least at fault. We have been the victims of a clever conspiracy. We can safely leave the rest to the police. The city was becoming normal again. By four o'clock it was practically deserted. The offices of the various banks were bursting with the repaid gold. Many clerks were closing up the books and looking forward to a good night's rest. It was almost impossible to believe that these were the same streets of a few hours before. Meantime, Ericsson and his partner in the inner room of their offices were gloating over a bewildering array of figures. Their gains from the gigantic hoax they had played on the public promised to run into millions. Rejoicing in the sudden turn in affairs, the two guilty men were building castles in the air with their ill-gotten wealth, when heavy footsteps came up from the office stairs. There was a knocking at the door. The two men started up. Their nerves were humming still from the strain of the past day and night. "'Come in!' Asherton Smith cried unsteadily. A couple of men entered. One of them had a paper in his hand. "'Mr. Asherton Smith and Mr. Carl Erickson, alias James Jones,' he said, "'I have a warrant for your arrest which I will read to you presently. I warn you not to say too much. Your accomplice, Jacob Peters, has been arrested at Cape Town, and I am instructed by Cable that he has made a full confession.' The snarling oath died away on Erickson's lips. "'It's all up,' he said hoarsely, "'but it was a chance. Curse Peters for a white-livered fool. But for him I should be worth fifty millions. End of story four.